but wonderful to be connecting with young people from all, all sorts of different countries. And uh, I've heard a lot about Elpro. I understand it's uh, in the top 50 schools in India. So congratulations for the leadership of the school at Elpro, but also for this Pangea um, uh, project. I'm also delighted that we went to a school in Wapping where uh, my mother's ancestors come from. And so my great grandfather was a senior sergeant in the police at Wapping. Look, I guess this is for me, it's a great honor. I have a special friendship and love of India. And as you've just heard some of it, I've been to India on 11 occasions. I've been to many, most of the major cities, Delhi, uh, Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, and so on. And also have holidayed in, in, in Rajasthan. One of the, the things that I love about it is India's history, its culture, its music, its film, and also, of course, its marvellous food. But one of the things that's also terrific is that it's given me an opportunity to make extraordinary friendships. And that's what Pangea is all about. It's about collaboration. It's about how we are interconnected. And it's also about friendships. And I'm very happy to talk about Bollywood later on if there's any questions and also about my appearance at the Ch uh, Chennai Stadium uh, where I uh, uh, played against uh, Chris Srikanth, the former, played cricket, the former captain of the Indian uh, cricket team. It was great, great fun. Today, in exploring the concept of Pangea, I'm going to particularly focus on the environment, which is an area that I've been involved in, but I thought first of all it might help if I kind of explained how I got into the position that I am in terms of, of working on climate change around the world. I was born in London, I was born in southeast London. At the age of, I, I didn't come from a rich background, quite the opposite, uh, my, you know, and so come from a very working class background. My parents made the decision when I was nine years of age to emigrate, to migrate to a new country, which was New Zealand, incredibly beautiful part of the Commonwealth of Nations. I stayed there um, through my high school days and went to university there and then became a political reporter. But I was passionate about politics. I was passionate about great causes. And in back in 1972, France, was testing its nuclear weapons, atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs in the South Pacific, polluting the atmosphere with radiation, polluting the seas with radiation. And they did so because they, they, some of their colonies were in South, the South Pacific, including Muro Atoll. A, whole, a small group of us, mainly young people, decided that we were going to stop the French from exploding nuclear weapons in the South Pacific. People laughed at us, like how could basically a bunch of university students stop what a superpower then, and one with atomic weapons from, from testing in the atmosphere? And, and how could we as just ordinary citizens, 20 year olds do this? What we did is that we with others got together and we sent a boat uh, across the sea, 3,000 miles, to sit under the site where the nuclear bomb was being strung up from a balloon at 1,000 feet above. Because we knew that if the, and we, we got the media involved, that if the French exploded that bomb, uh, that it would kill the people on board more than kill them. It would just be obliteration. So by doing this, we brought the world's attention to what was going on in someone else's backyard that a, where a superpower was polluting our planet. For one, an event happened that the French, we were in international waters, so we weren't breaking any laws. It's important to uh, obey the law. But what, we did, what happened is that the French boarded our little boat. It was just a tiny yacht with four people on board, uh, including two young women, two guys. And they beat up the commandos, beat up the, the two guys, very, bashed one very, very badly. And then they captured, um, they captured the four people on board and towed the boat away. Fortunately, 
one of the young women was taking photos of the bashing up of people, the illegal boarding and everything else on a tiny camera. They were taken to Tahiti. The French government put out a statement saying that they had rescued a boat in distress. And, and then when we came out and said um, that this was not true, that they were illegally boarded, they were beaten up, uh, they said that we were lying. Fortunately, when they were eventually released, and this, the people accusing us of, of lying um, were the prime ministers and presidents of France. Fortunately, when our people were released and went came, and came back to their base, they had the photos because the, the young woman, Anne-Marie Horn, had switched photos in the camera and the other one was detained. Those were released to the world and it showed that the French president and prime minister had lied to the world. That caused the Australian government and the New Zealand government to come out in support of what we were doing. New Zealand sent an unarmed warship into the zone and they took the Fra France to the International Court of Justice at The Hague and won and it banned, they, it, it, it ended up with banning French from testing atomic bombs in the atmosphere. So a small bunch of young people, not much older than you, stopped a superpower. And we formed a group that was ended up becoming Greenpeace and is now doing things around the world. When I finished university, I went to into journalism, became a political reporter. Eventually I was offered a job in Australia as the political advisor, media advisor to a very charismatic premier called Don Dunson. I was only 24 at the time. And from him and others, I learned a couple of important lessons that I wanted to tell you about today. First of all, totally the importance of a good education. Secondly, the importance of mentors, those who were older than, than you, older than me at the time, who ended up being guiding spirits to me throughout my career. You can always learn. And I also discovered something else, that if you really want something badly enough, that there are few, very few barriers that can stop you achieving your goals and ambitions if you're prepared to work hard enough and try hard enough. I talk about, people talk about being commitment, but there's also resilience. That means standing up when, when you're knocked down, never being feeling defeated. And then finally, uh, an issue that I think is really important is persistence. Keep turning up, keep going. If you keep going, you'll, you'll get there. And you can make a difference in the world. And the other thing that I learned is that the world is often divided between those who want to be and those who want to do. Those who want to be include you know, people who want to be rich, want to be famous, want to be powerful. But the real heroes are those who want to do, those who want to make a difference and provide opportunities for others and to embrace the global village, the Pangaea concept that we're celebrating and talking about today. These are the real heroes. I then decided having worked for lots of different politicians, prime ministers and premiers, that I would basically wanted to have a go myself. I was getting sick of writing speeches for others. So I thought it was time I wrote speeches for myself. So I got elected to parliament in South Australia, not New Zealand, and then became a young minister for employment and further education and Aboriginal affairs. And later on um, became um, uh, at the leader of the Labour Party for 17 years in, in my, my state. And what we did during that time that we were in government, when I was Premier, was do some good things. We basically became an international leader in renewable energy. We wanted to show not just our own state, but other states of Australia what could be achieved. And one of the things, we had zero renewable energy when we started. It's now 60% of the state's electricity comes from renewable energy. And by 2030, 100%. And so that means that, that we're no longer dependent on coal-fired power stations. We're no longer dependent on, on oil or gas, with fossil fuels. 
we, instead, we're relying overwhelmingly on wind power and solar power. We also did some other things. We were very strong on the environment, massively expanding national parks and environmental protection areas, including marine parks to, to, to conserve the breeding grounds of fish. We tackled important issues like mental health and homelessness. We doubled our expenditure on health and we also got our economy moving. And as I mentioned at the start, that at, at the start of this process, um, that we, you know, we, we are interconnected because the greatest example of how interconnected we are, are our oceans and our seas. They're the lifeblood of our environment and our economy. I'm from Australia where we're a big island, you know, a very, very big island, the biggest of the lot. And 99% of our exports are dispatched to destinations around the world by ship uh, across the ocean. The shipping industry is in fact responsible for carrying 90% of world trade. And so without shipping, without our oceans and that being interconnected, that we wouldn't be able to see the export of food or cars, machinery, iron and steel. And there are 50,000 cargo ships that cross our oceans connecting us. But the oceans are important in other ways as a source of food. Fish and seafood are a basic component in the diets of billions of people around the world. About 100 million tons of fish are caught commercially. Nearly as many again are from agriculture or fish farms. And our seas and coastlines are important for tourism and recreation. So why do we treat our oceans as if they were dumping grounds, the sewers, rather than our precious lifeblood? We've been treating our oceans as if they're infinite resource that we can do anything to, that we can assault in any way. But of course, and we think that they could quickly recover. So David Attenborough, one of my heroes, the world famous naturalist has pointed out that we now face the consequences of our actions because the seas are warming and they're rising and becoming more acid. The United Nations has said that by the end of this century, we could see three feet or a one meter rise in sea levels. People say, oh, well, it's only three feet. That would cause devastation for billions of people who live in low coastal areas, as well as the 65 million people on small island who live on small island developing states. Their whole lives, livelihoods are at stake. These people will be especially at risk from a combination of flooding, extreme weather events, cyclones and storms of the nature that used to be seen once in 100 years, but from a few years from now, by 2050 will happen once a year. And this will make vast regions of the world uninhabitable. We'll, we'll see the end of people, the destruction of people's homes and infrastructure like school, produce large numbers of refugees with huge economic problems as a result. And there is another problem, the increasing acidification of the ocean. And meanwhile, plastic is one of the gravest challenges facing the world's oceans. A few years ago, again, Sir David Attenborough reported that more than 150 million tons of plastic is drifting the world's oceans, causing the death of 1 million birds and 100,000 sea mammals, that's mammals, as well as countless fish around the world. And he produced this film called Blue Planet. And one of the most moving scenes was that of, of a beautiful albatross, the world's biggest, biggest bird, that was seen feeding, that the albatross was seen feeding their chicks a diet of plastic. Prince Charles, who I'm a great admirer of, says that we're doing that what we're doing to the planet make, makes him fear that we're no longer a rational civilization, but are instead driven by some strange economic ideology. I call it greed, short term thinking, the exact opposite of Pangaea and the concept of our global village. So let me tell you a couple of initiatives and then I want to talk about things that you might want to do that we did in South Australia. In 2009, we were the first in Australia, the first state in Australia to 
introduce a ban on plastic bags of the kind that they use in supermarkets, non-renewable, single use. Now, we've, South Australia, my state, has a big land area, three times bigger than Maharashtra, but with a very, very small population by comparison. But even our ban stopped 400 million plastic bags each year, polluting the environment. And that would have built up, it would have been billions by now. And so these bags, of course, would have been, if we'd have, without the ban, these bags would have contributed to greenhouse gases, to clogging landfill dumps, to littering streets, getting into drains, into waterways like rivers, the sea, killing wildlife. And people told me beforehand, this is going to really annoy people. You're going to get thrown out at the next election. People will be angry because you're banning plastic bags and telling people they have to take a cloth bag to get their groceries, green groceries, and so on. The great news is, is always have faith in the people. 80% of the people of South Australia strongly supported our ban and were proud to go to the shops carrying cloth bags. And now, more than 10 years later, one by one, other states in Australia are doing the same thing. We also solar powered our airport, our parliament, our agricultural showgrounds convention center. We put panels on the roofs of countless schools. We solar powered, uh, or part solar powered other buildings like um, the, the museums and art galleries. And now almost one in three homes in Adelaide, our capital city is solar powered. We also planted three million trees in a series of urban forests throughout the city of Adelaide, in schools, roadways, parks. We got people involved, celebrities, politicians, school kids, elderly people, leaders of different religions. This was about making the city more beautiful, but also cleaning the air and also calling our streets. There are, you know, there are other things that I think people can do, um, which is, and that's really why I wanted today to talk about what you could do, which I think could really be helpful, where you could make a difference and where you could actually underpin the Pangea movement and be an example to the rest of the world. So what could you do? A lot. Make sure that your school is the greenest of any school that, you've, that anybody has heard of in your local region or area. Work with your teachers to plant trees and shrubs and fruit trees, particularly which have other benefits. Um, also, of course, you know, we know that, that trees are the lungs of our planet. So in addition to fruit trees, make sure that there are trees that are indigenous to your local area and, and from growing them from seed. Also, I think that you should talk to your teachers about how you can make your schools more energy efficient, um, which is like turning things off like computers and lights when you're not not around, how you can embrace um, recycling, how you can change the way you do things where you're not only making a difference for your environment, but for all our environment. And that means things like um, a band, making sure that you don't use plastic, uh, cut back the use of plastic in your school, home, and in your personal use. Remember that fresh food is best don't buy junk food wrapped in plastic containers. Avoid plastic bags at all costs. Don't use plastic knives, plates, forks, spoons, or plastic cups. And if you're offered a plastic bag in a shop, say no thank you. And also ask your schools whether you could have a vegetable garden at the school. I did when I was a, a kid in school in New Zealand, we had a vegetable garden and we were allowed to take the vegetables home. And my son went to a school in South Australia where they had this fantastic vegetable garden and the school, which was a, a small primary school up to the age of 11 or 12, concentrated on being an environmental school. Recycle. Don't live in a throwaway, throwaway economy. Work with your teachers at your school to see what can be recycled. And work with your local town or village to recycle. Work with your... Uh, uh, and, also make sure that 
you get the message about cutting back plastic use to stop communities looking like rubbish dumps. Put pressure on politicians. This is, and so I can say this as a former politician, I'm sure David will agree. It's really important to write to the local MPs, lo your local mayor, your the, the members of parliament representing cities and states and talk to them about what you're doing at the local level, and, but what you would like them to do. Invite them to, once you've made your school a Pangea school committed to the environment, committed to sustainability, make sure you invite them to come and see what's possible elsewhere. And I guess, and before opening up for questions, remember, as I told you at the start, a small group of young people stopped a powerful nation, a nation exploding nuclear bombs in the atmosphere, stopping them polluting the world from, from, in, from someone else's backyard. So whenever anyone tells you that it is impossible to do things, don't believe them. Everything is possible. At least a major advance is possible. If you try hard enough, work hard enough, and there's nothing that can stop you to better your life, the lives of your neighbors, the life of your family, the lives of people in your local area and your nation and the world for the better. Make your school, make your village an inspiration for others by showing what can be achieved. Remember you've got in even the smallest ways, great power, the power of your example. Also, one of the things I wanted to say, too, it's really important to treat each other well, to treat each other with respect, even if you disagree with people. And also, that respect must come about no matter what other people's religions or backgrounds or economic circumstances are. You know, I'm really inspired these days by the young woman who is the Prime Minister of New Zealand. She has made a point of not only being committed to the environment, committed to sustainability, but also to reconciliation of bringing people of all backgrounds together, never submitting to pressure. If you ever hear a politician trying to divide, not unite, don't vote for them when, you grow, when you're grown up and, uh, and able to vote because you know that deep down they are fake and are trying to play people off against each other for their own advantage. So in closing and inviting questions, I have great confidence and faith in your future because for years people have been saying, listen to the wisdom of your elders, and that's true. But it's also these days really important to listen to the wisdom of young people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mike. What an inspiring talk and some really amazing takeaways for all of us. I particularly think that that, that you just said that, you know, we inspire each other. The fact about, uh, you know, having a school that's uh, like an inspiration, learning from each other, the environment bit. There, are, there were just so many key takeaways from this entire talk. Um, I invite our uh, you know, guests in the audiences uh, in, on the Zoom meet and on Facebook to put in questions for Mr. Mike Rand. If there is any, you all can raise hands on Zoom or you all can put in your questions on the chat. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Ananj Prasad. Ananj, your domain completely. Please help me moderate the Q&A. Ananj Prasad, the founder and managing director of Skillsphere Education and our co-host for this event. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Suganda, ma'am. And Mike, it was an absolute pleasure listening to you uh, talking about the importance of environmental sustainability, the importance of fighting for the environment, the fact that absolutely nothing is impossible and the importance of uh, global unity in many ways, right from politics to other streams of life. Uh, I think you've really enlightened us with this wonderful speech and we honestly couldn't have asked for anything better at the closing ceremony of a conference that has, won that has gone off so wonderfully well. We have a lot of questions and honestly, a lot of questions are coming in via Facebook too. Uh, we'll allow a student to inaugurate this question and answer session with you. Teshi, go ahead. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you so much, Mike. Um, I loved your speech so much. I think it was very inspiring for me. 
especially with those uh, thoughts where, you know, we should know who to vote for and we should know where our interest lies. Um, my question basically revolves around the fact that um, our generation, we care about the environment very much and, you know, we're very strongly, we put our foot very strongly forward and we hold our opinions to the very extreme manner. So my question is basically, how do we make sure that while we amalgamate these technological advancements that we're going through, as at the same time protecting our environment and making sure that the world still remains for you know the future generations to come and come? It's a very good question. And actually, it's interesting because a lot of the things that I told you about, including our embrace of renewable energy in South Australia, were strongly opposed, not just by our political opponents, but people that, the, you know, the media and others came out and said that we would wreck the economy, that a whole range of things, even the plastic bag ban, I was told was going to wreck the economy and all this sort of stuff. And, the, and that's always the resistance part of it. But now what's, and that's been the worldwide view against renewable energy and because the fossil fuel industry, oil and gas and petroleum have been working in many ways like the cigarette companies, tobacco companies of the past when the, the movement came about because of uh, the problems with causing lung cancer, which many denied for decades. And so there's always resistance because, the, because they're thinking about their greed. But now what's happened is that renewable energy has become bankable. Renewable energy has become profitable. It's become cheaper to produce energy and electricity as technolog technology has advanced. And so that means that the giant pension funds that have trillions of dollars are now putting their investments as well as the banks rapidly into renewable and sustainable futures and investments. So when something becomes bankable, all of the people that resisted uh, renewable energy are now thinking, oh, hang on, we can make more money out of this. So what we're seeing in the last four or five years is this incredible momentum towards investing in renewables with giant banks and others now saying that they won't put money and won't invest in fossil fuel technologies. I want to praise one person, Prince Charles. Prince Charles has absolutely led this campaign. He's called it the Great Reset about investing in sustainability. And, you know, it's pretty difficult position, the Prince of Wales, but he has played, in my view, I know that he works with the heads of banks and so on, has played a major role. So my view is that environment and technology are actually joining together because one it's going to end up being cheaper easier as well as playing a major role in reducing our carbon emissions thank you so much for that answer teshi i am sure that answers your question as well as a range of other facets associated with the question uh, gary uh, a dear collaborator once again and co-host from Wapping High School, Gary, would you like to ask a question? Thank you, Ananch. Uh, I just wanted to say, Mike, uh, I agree with everybody that's spoken after you've spoken there. That really was inspirational. If you don't mind me saying, you remind me of my, um, my first CEO as an exec head up in Manchester and the north of England who had three kind of mantra background kind of principles to the way we ran, which was a rather large organisation. And she talked about integrity, passion and hard work, and you've got them in buckets. So thank you, Mike, for inspiring us all today. You've Thank shared you. so much. <laughs> yeah, cheers. You, you, you shared so much. I was nodding furiously away and smiling and enjoying and thinking about my next assembly when we return to school after the UK lockdown in terms of our priorities as a school. If you had one sentence to share the highest priority, priority tip for young people, not only in the UK, but everybody here and everywhere across the world, what would it be to chase a career of great success? I think getting back to those three um, principles of, you know, I, for years as a young person, people said, you know, it's all about commitment. And that's true, but it's only part of the story. Persistence, making yourself indispensable. Someone said, those who turn up prevail. Basically, volunteer to do things. So commitment, 
persistence, keep at it, don't get, you know, you, you pers keep, keep at it, just keep going. And then finally, resilience, because I've seen all in achieving these things along the way, there's lots of setbacks, there's lots of disappointments. But if you're resilient enough, if you believe enough, not only in your cause, but in yourself, then that resilience means that when you get knocked over, you bounce back, you've learned from it, and then you win, you know? You, and so, and, and the most important thing too, I think, is to make sure that if you can combine your own personal ambitions with doing good in the world by making the life of others better, then you're going to live fulfilling life and you are going to be something. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much, Mike, for that answer. And thank you for your question, Gary. Uh, before I move on to the question from Svetlana, uh, there is a question that we have received from some of our viewers on the Facebook live stream. And I would like to ask one of those questions. It's an interesting question, Mike. The question is that in this consumerist world, wouldn't it really be a challenge to steer the youth towards sustainability in your opinion? People often say that, but, you know, I, and I guess that's one of the things that I learned from our plastic bag ban, that, that people, because of the consumer culture, would get really irritated. I mean, I'm not supposed to reveal what goes on in cabinet meetings, but I can tell you that a number of my closest friends in cabinet were saying, I think this is going to be really unpopular. The shopping centres don't want it. Um, this is going to you know, cause real problems. There'll be confusion and so on. And the media were waiting for that confusion and went out on the day, on the first day where we flipped over to, you can't, you know, no more plastic bags. You have to take your own bag and get your groceries and so on. The media came back and they were interviewing people who said, this is fantastic. People like being a world leader or a national leader. They feel proud of themselves, their state and their nation. But when we did some polling on it, we found out, I told you 80% support from people across the board, but the support from young people was 90%. So I think that it's all about explaining things. People do on, you know, often do things on face value and don't because you've always done it that way. And so I think that if you explain to people and make it a cause that's driven by young people, that's the key rather than old fellows like me you know, telling people what to do. If it's driven, if it comes from within, if it's youth leadership, it means that people, the other young people are inspired. And it's the same as what we did, you know, back in 50 years ago, 48 years ago with the Greenpeace campaign I told you about. It was driven by young people, but ended up with 80% of New Zealanders supporting a group of young people who were essentially protesters, uh, taking on what people thought was an impossible cause. It's all about pride. And it's about pride in doing things and changing things for the better. Thank you so much for that answer. I couldn't agree more with you, Mike. I think um, this also brings us to a very important 21st century skill in empathy, the importance of empathy, not sympathizing with the environment, but empathizing with all of humankind and the importance of feeling for a cause and driving it forward with leadership qualities and a zest and fervor that will inspire others around you. Svetlana, that brings me to your question. Hello everyone, good morning to me, good afternoon to some and evening to others. Um, Mike, it was uh, incredibly inspiring listening to you. Um, we have some similarities. Uh, I'm from Brazil, I work in a um, uh, private school here in Brazil and I am very, very uh, enthusiastic about the Pangea movement. Uh, environmental issues is something very present in my life, and I uh, I take great pride in 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 uh, initiatives that we take in our schools as well that we want to move on, and you know it, it it's more of a, a comment rather than a question itself. Uh, you talked about the ban of disposable plastic bags. 
it, it has generated such a great impact all over the world to all countries that have um, uh, implemented that. And I just wanted to say that, you know, there is a movement here in Brazil that has greatly inspired me because I think it is very much so, it's very important, which is what you, you were saying last, uh, to think about what, uh, what kinds of issues are you passionate about and then set about to uh, find solutions. One movement that we have here is that we went beyond just the ban of plastic bags in supermarkets here. And we have created, we have set out to create a biodegradable model, which have beautiful prints of local artists. And therefore also not only supporting artistic movement, right? but also making it viable for them to get a monetary participation in it. It's small, but uh, since it's a, it's a highly uh, sustainable business model in, in terms of business, it, it has created uh, some very interesting uh, movements regarding that as well. So every six months, there are a, a huge collection of uh, different uh, plastic bags which have been um, which have been uh, done by local artists. Every state has its own collections. Uh, different supermarkets have their own collections. They are beautiful. They are really beautiful to hold. They are very cheap. They are very, very uh, in, uh, durable and they're environmentally friendly. And I think when we start to pressure, to put this pressure onto society and also onto politicians to make uh, the, to pass these laws, we also push our creativity somehow. We have seen here the ban of plastic straws, which have been replaced by avocado pits, uh, um, made straws. So I think this is also a very important aspect to bring to schools because I think uh, there are lots of students that have ideas and that would love and would be very inspired to have challenges like this to develop. I would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Svetlana. I think that's a terrific idea about also incorporating art into it. And uh, I you know, really hope that others will take up what you're doing. That makes eminent sense. One of the things that, and it wasn't my initiative, although we improved it later, but the guy that I went to Australia to work for, uh, Premier Don Dunstan, he brought in a recycling scheme, which was that, that you know, we, there was a real problem around Australia with people drinking out of cans, Coca-Cola, whatever it was, beer cans and so on, or bottles, and then throwing them into the litter stream or, you know, just throwing them down or piling up in, in, um, in rubbish bins along streets and so on. So what he did in 1976 is say, he put a price on each of them, five cents extra. And it meant that people either, and then I changed it to 10 cents. So every time someone picks up a bottle, they take it to a recycling center and they get 10 cents for it. So what it's done is stimulate a multi-million dollar recycling industry um, rather than things that are dis discarded, incredibly clean streets and roadways and environment. And then we added other things in like um, milk uh, cartons made of cardboard. So essentially things that were containers for drinks could all be returned. You got 10 cents. And, and then what happened is that um, you, were, you took it back, you refunded the 10 cents. So it meant that people like the Boy Scouts, the Girl Guides, the Rotarians and others would send people out into the streets, finding these bottles in giant um, uh, rubbish bins and so on and taking it to the re and they're raising fundraising for charities. So again, you've got an industry out of it. You, there was no change in the number of people drinking. So the industry said it will destroy our business, it didn't. And that, so over the years, it's got better and better. And now, that was 1976, now other states are just starting to do it. So I guess it's really important to be a leader. And what you're doing and what you've just told me is real leadership. Just, and it's really good you're talking to others because I think that if you can explain how it works, you'll find that others will take it on. But the art connection is wonderful. 
Thank you so much for that, Mike, and thank you so much for that wonderful question and uh, sharing another very interesting facet of Brazil. Yesterday, Svetlana talked about how music is integrated into education. You have talked about how uh, you know environmental sustainability is being incorporated into overall culture. I think these are great learnings for us uh, across the globe. Thank you so much for that. And